afternoon, everybody. My name is the Jazz Shepherd. I'm Dan. <clears throat> We're covering jazz labels from 1955 through 1960 or so. This is part 15, Fantasy Records. Starts in the Bay Area, represents the West Coast, kind of along with Contemporary and Pacific. Uh, in 49, a guy named Jack Sheedy started a small label called Coronet, issuing kind of traditional New Orleans Dixieland jazz. The label wasn't very successful making money. His pressing company was run by a couple of brothers named Max and Sol Weiss. They ended up taking ownership of Coronet. And this is not the same as the New York label Coronet. This is a totally different beast. And when the Weiss brothers came all over, they renamed it Fantasy Records, obviously. Uh, Fantasy is kind of renowned for Creedence Clearwater Revival, which comes in the late 60s. And they really made four or five landmark records in the rock and roll idiom, of, of course. But uh, they were an important jazz label in the late 50s. They tend to be a little more on the easy listening side with a lot of Latin influences, uh, in part because of the great Cal Jader, who was on the label forever. We'll get back to him in a second. Uh, the label was initially a Dave Brubeck thing. Brubeck was being sold fairly well on that Coronet label that Jack Sheedy ran. And when, and when the Weiss brothers take over Coronet, the demand for the Brubeck stayed pretty strong, which is kind of why they decided to keep the label alive and press other things as well. Uh, they cover a pretty wide range of, from almost in independent jazz artists to kind of broader, like I said, Brubeck and, and Cal Jader, that was pretty national, of course. Um, Mulligan was brought to the label by Brubeck, as was Chet Baker and Red Norvo. And then Brubeck finds out at some point that what he thought he owned 50% of as a label, he only owned 50% of his recordings. And that led him to leave Fantasy and go to Columbia, where of course history tells us he made a lot of the most important best-selling records on Columbia in jazz history, but that's what having a major label behind you does. It changes the game. Miles' sales records as well are a reflection of being on Columbia. National distribution. It changes the entire spectrum. It's like a mom and palm shop versus Walmart. They're going to get everywhere with that stuff, you know? Uh, Fantasy also launches a small uh, subsidiary label they bought from Charles Mingus, uh, the debut label, which has some interesting, pretty out there stuff. I'm gonna cover that in a different episode. Uh, some of it's just live recordings that are on the edge of what's happening at that time. But they didn't want it on their main imprint, so they put it, they, you know, it was a, actually a gift Mingus gave it to one of the new a &R people at Fantasy. Uh, we'll dig into some of the records here. Woody Herman went to, Par uh, went to Europe in 54 with the third herd, and his herdsman, I make this record and uh, it's on green vinyl and fantasy will come in green most often red for mono and then blue usually represents the stereo but the third herd has some pretty incredible players in it including Bill Perkins including Cy Tooth including Ralph Burns so it's a pretty uh, cool record I really dug a lot with a great cover the great Red Rodney who we talked about the other day on Argo has this lit, uh, pretty early recording here on Fantasy. It's Fantasy number 3208. The 3200 series is the main Fantasy sequence. It starts as 3-200, but then eventually it just becomes 3200. Uh, everything that I've bought so far in the Fantasy label is what it is. It's kind of West Coast. It's a little bit easy listening. Uh, the Brubeck especially is going to be that. Mulligan has some sessions here. There's also a large 10-inch discography from the early 50s, just like Contemporary, just like Pacific. Uh, now we're going to show you some of the Brubeck titles, and there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. You know, he's there long enough to put out 15 records on the Fantasy label. Uh, of course, Paul Desmond was a big part of Brubeck's success. And uh, 
Thank God for Paul Desmond. He's one of the most beautiful lyrical players ever. This was one of my first fantasies. I got this probably 20 years ago, Jazz at Oberlin. So you can see there's a lot of Brubeck to find on fantasy. I found most of it, excluding some of the 10-inch stuff, but a lot of that was reissued on 12-inch. Uh, the other major component of fantasy records, of course, was the Cal Jader. And they aren't afraid to use Pretty Women on their album covers. I'm always a fan of Pretty Women cocktails, so who am I to complain about Pretty Women and cocktails? This is a very early 3202. I believe that's the second thing released after that Herdsman record. I was like that color coordination. <clears throat> so there's definitely a feel of the Southwest here. That's at the Blackhawk. Again, there's some integration there, which is an important aspect of what this music is doing. Definitely a Southwest theme going on there. So, pretty solid art department, nothing groundbreaking. I always enjoy a good fantasy record. The red vinyl's fun, the blue stereos are actually pretty tough to find, it seems like, compared to the monos. Uh, it's harder to tell if a red record's gonna play well, for, for my eyesight anyway. I look at them and sometimes I'm like, that's not gonna sound good and it sounds fine. Other times I look at them like that's gonna be perfect and it doesn't play well, so I don't know if there was a, a pressing issue with some of their pressing plants or something, or if it was something about the red and the vinyl. Some of them sound great, so again, I don't really understand, but Fantasy's a great label. It kind of wraps up those three major West Coast labels. And now we're going to move on to what Columbia and some of the major labels did in the late 50s. And I want people to see just how watered down and safe what the major labels are doing, especially in the early LP era. By 59, 58, they're signing some Donald Byrd, some Miles Davises, some Thelonious Monks. So Columbia is starting to change its course by the late 50s. And in the 60s, Columbia makes some pretty straightforward, great jazz records with a much wider range and it pushes jazz to a whole new level of audience that probably doesn't match the appeal and the broadness of the swing era, but it's a whole different kind of music by this point, absolutely. Uh, Fantasy, again, is a big part of the OJC series and they're the ones that actually bought up the Riversides and the, the contemporaries and, leached, and launched the whole OJC thing. Old OJCs from the 80s are great value. 15, 20 bucks, now you'll find them. They were originally four or five, but they play well, they sound good. I think they were pressed in the original metal discs. Uh, there's plenty of people who talk about the audiophile stuff, so I'll leave that to them. Great stuff, great for cocktails. If you wanna have eat, eat drinks from your pineapple in the backyard, put on a Cal Jader record. Your friends will thank you. They won't know why they feel so joyous. It's happy music, it's fun music, it's well-produced music. It's filling the niche of that West Coast kind of hipster cool. Because Contemporary and Pacific are a little bit more serious, a little bit more trying to be the hard bop from the East Coast, trying to be modern in every essence of the way. And I think Contemporary was a little bit more, I mean, sorry, fantasy. They were gonna do some stuff that was gonna be a little bit, some throwback to the swing era. A little Dixie feel in there still, always with a Latin tinge. Brubeck, Jader, Fantasy, can't go wrong. It's great stuff. For the most part, with the exception of a few of those Brubeck records, nothing's going to set you back more than 15 bucks. Always great players. I've said it in a lot of these episodes now. Even obscure titles on these labels, there's going to be some great playing on there. That's just how things were at that time. Uh, I appreciate you all for watching. Subscribe to my channel. Once we get done with the major label rundown, we're gonna real quick look through that. We're gonna dig into some of the more obscure one-offs from the small labels. Stuff I don't have enough information to make a whole episode on, but we gotta talk about the Sonny Chris and Prio records. There's stuff like that we gotta bring up. So we're gonna do an episode dedicated to those kind of isolated little record labels that have a few things here and there that I don't know much about. The Imperials, the Crowns, the Corrals. There's some good stuff there. So we'll get to that, we'll touch on that. And then we're gonna to move to round two. Start with Blue Note, Prestige, and Riverside, and talk about what they were doing in the late 50s, and so forth. So appreciate you all for watching. Again, subscribe to my channel, tell your friends about it who like jazz. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Love to hear your feedback and comments. Have a great day, thanks.